Rerum Novarum, 1891, begins with these sentences. That the spirit of new things, translated revolutionary change, but it's actually the spirit of new things, which has long disturbed the nations of the world, should have passed beyond the sphere of politics and made its influence in the cognate sphere of practical economics is not surprising. In the century since the French Revolution, Catholics had been an intellectual ferment about the fracturing of social order, chiefly the relationship between the church and the new states, but also in what pertained to practical economics. When Leo was elected in 1878, what was called social Catholicism was at high tide. Amazingly, it flourished with almost no important magisterial teaching from above. This is back when Catholics actually did social thought, and it all did not come from Rome. It was the era of Catholic circles and associations led by such luminaries as La Tour de Pen, Leon Harmel, Albert de Mun, Emmanuel von Kettler, and many others. The Freiburg Union, 1884, was the first international organization of Catholic social thinkers. And it was representatives of that union who urged Leo in 1888 to teach from on high about the cluster of social issues pertaining to economy. It's noteworthy, but not surprising that the opening sentence that I just read of Rerum Novarum should refer to the French Revolution. The encyclical was written in 1889-1890 during the centennial celebration of the revolution. Leo and his advisors were more than a little irked that in Rome the anniversary of 1789 was marked by the erection of a statue in the Campo dei Fiori to the martyr of science and the cosmologist of infinite worlds, Giordano Bruno, who was tried by the Roman Inquisition and in 1600 burned at the stake in that very piazza. The main celebration, of course, was held in Paris, where some 32 million found their way to the Universal Exposition. Its organizing committee, excuse me, I'm still dried out from jet lag, its organizing committee accepted architect architectural drafts for an enormous centennial tower. After rejecting several submissions, including a plan for a 300 meter tower in the form of a guillotine, <laughs> the contract was awarded to Gustav Eiffel. It was then reckoned the tallest building in the world and it celebrated French science and economic prosperity. American celebrities like Buffalo Bill and Thomas Edison attended the Hall of Machinery and the Colonial Exhibition, which portrayed the fruits of science and money, namely civilizational prowess in mastering lands and peoples beyond the seas. Most impressively, more than half of the funding for the exposition was supplied by a private investor's guarantee association, which yielded a healthy profit. Welcome to modernity, the French Revolution brought to you by Goldman Sachs. <laughs> and the theme song of the exposition included a line that could have come from one of our Super Bowl halftime shows. I quote, I have destroyed the old laws I bring hope. And the French Revolution provided one-stop shopping for Catholic social thinking for a long time. Leo referred to it as the Great Conflagration, like an event out of the book of Genesis that had destroyed an original or old order of things, even in its decrepit condition in the late 18th century. Catholic society had been a culture of vows. Not contracts, but vows. And in 1789, that culture of vows was swiftly capsized. In 1790, the revolution issued decrees prohibiting monastic vows. 
then solemn vows, and in their place required a clerical oath to the civil constitution of the church. In 1791, marriage was made only a civil contract. The vow of celibacy for secular clergy was relaxed. In 1792, two further decrees finished the reorganization of that society. The first provided for unilateral and no-fault divorce, and the second abolished the monarchy, and thus the demise of the two great vows of Catholic laity, husband to wife and king to the realm. Well, the church's response was vehement, but not very well focused. Uh, issue, Leo himself issued no syllabus of errors. Rather, he asked a question that was at once more philosophical and practical. How do we civilize the situation? What is our proposal for social order rightly apprehended? What can we work with in social matters? How do we measure what's been lost and what might be regained? And he said in Rerum Novarum, actually my favorite line, it's the beginning of a sentence, Nothing is more useful than to look upon the world as it really is. Catholic social teaching from on high was never intended to be utopian. More about that later. So, Leo's paradigm. The Leonine paradigm for social analysis, remember that it begins about a century after the French Revolution. It was remarkable for its sturdiness and simplicity. Basically, it was a neo-Aristotelian effort to put the spirits of the age into perennial wineskins. Just as the first principle in all modes of practical reasoning is human happiness, so too in social matters, our framework should be the three necessary societies. That is, societies necessary for human happiness. They include marriage and family, what was called domestic society, polity, and church. Leo's student, Pius XI, quote, now there are three necessary societies, distinct from one another and yet harmoniously combined by God into which a man is born. Two, namely the domestic and the civil society belong to the natural order, the third, the church to the supernatural order. Unquote. There are many other associations that enjoy a truly social principle as well, but they are perhaps more transient, revisable, and subject to the free designs of human ingenuity. Should these free associations wither, we would have a social problem along the lines of Putman, you know, people is not bowling as much together anymore. But a demise of the necessary societies would mark a social calamity. To paraphrase and revise the Aristotelian dictum, the human person is a matrimonial, familial animal, a political animal, and an ecclesial animal. That's the Leonine paradigm. It's remarkable how they could rework this paradigm over and over again not just with regard to the effects of the French Revolution, but two world wars and a depression. Upon his election in 1878, Leo turned immediately to this tri triadic paradigm. In Quad Apostolici, 1878, he argued against the position of what he took to be socialism, that society can be reduced to an equal or self-same bits of the same society. Leo, therefore, began with the most basic proposition. There are plural societies with quite diverse modes of membership, and, and each one of those societies have quite diverse relations within them. In Eterni Patris, 1879, he portrayed the church as a house of wisdom, nourished by philosophical science and divine revelation. In Arcanum Divinae, 1881, Leo issued the first formal and synoptic teaching on Christian marriage since the Council of Trent. 
In Diaturnum, 1881, he examined the, order, the origin of political authority. That Leonine IOS was up and running within three years of his election as Pope. He made a beeline for a philosophical investigation and defense of the three necessary societies. Human happiness depends considerably, he argued, especially as an encyclical of arcanum on marriage and family, on the domestic order. You will note that although rerum novarum includes toward the end a very important argument for the liberty of voluntary associations, the gravamen of the argument is the rights and obligations of wage labor pertaining to the support and perfection of the family. Today, we almost always take it out of that context, but it's really dangerous to take it out because the teleology of happiness, not just the father or the mother, but of further generations, depends on domestic order. Now, it's sh surely the case that the dignity of wage labor reflects the human person as an image bearer, just as Aquinas said. An image bearer capacitated to be provident for himself and for others. A person who transcends animal instinct and who does not just produce, but does so on the basis of rational foresight. And therefore, he has a right to have at his disposal stable property as well as an obligation to provide even for social life beyond his natural lifespan. That's part of the argument. And that's first manifest and tactile and face-to-face -face in family. It's the obligation of the ecclesial society to sanctify and to teach its members. And in Rerum Novarum, Leo emphasizes the importance of not only the sacramental bond of mat matrimony, but of the wisdom of using material goods rightly, sub specie eternitatis. The church teaches the laborer and his family, not just to be provident for the family and for future generations, but to understand that there's more than transient things. To summarize, these necessary societies have in common, analogically, right? the following properties. They are not purely voluntary, not in the fashion of a societas arbitraria that can be created or dissolved according to transient circumstances. Moreover, in the case of marriage and church, the form and ends of the societies are instituted by nature or supernature. Polity is somewhat different because although its end is given by nature, it has more than one legitimate form. It can be ruled by one, ruled by a few, ruled by many, or it's more likely a, a mixed form. So the first point, the three necessary societies are not purely voluntary. In the way that I could have a voluntary trainer at my gym just on Tuesdays and Thursdays or none at all. Second, they are not disposable platforms for life, lifestyle. We are meant to dwell in them. In fact, one of Leo's favorite verbs is inhabitere, to actually inhabit and live in it or dwell in it. We live in a marriage, a family, a polity, and a church in different ways, to be sure, but they have in common a social principle let's say a social intention in the strict sense of the term, which is to participate in the union. It's the union itself that is loved. Although much differently, church, family, and polity. Therefore, a true society is not an aggregation of exchanges and distributions, even if such divisible things need to be properly exchanged and distributed. We live in societies not in social movements, political parties, field hospitals, Starbucks, or in Euro-style culture without boundaries. Third, 
each is subsidiary to the other. And this follows from the very meaning of a necessary society. Under normal conditions, members who dwell in one society dwell also in the others. Those living in the domestic society are also members of the French Republic and members of St. Regis Parish. This principle has been called by Charles Taylor, hierarchical complementarity. Society is made up of different social orders and therefore they have relations that are truly mutual. They need one another, but one cannot replace the others. Each exists as a true society, but each also exists with the other dignified orders. In some, it is not sufficient for human happiness to, to dwell rightly only in one of them. Now, during the Leonine era, which really virtually reached into the middle of the 20th century because six popes were either born or came of age during his papacy, uh, John the 23rd and Paul the sixth, both. Uh, John the 23rd was a seminarian in Rome when, when Leo was pope. During this period, which reached into the middle of the 20th century, the chief problem anarchists and Bolsheviks put to one side, was not outright rejection of the so-called necessary societies. The problem was getting the right balance according to the principle of complementarity. The bad guys usually were the nation states, which wanted the state to have the first and the last word over the alignment of these three societies. Therefore, we should not be surprised that the most persistent dispute, both in Europe and the New World, was over schools. The esteemed church historian Roger O'Bara has called the school issue the classic battleground. For the school was the locus of competition between the three great societies, church, parents, and state. All three of the necessary societies, in a way, in their own way, are nurseries of human formation. You could call them nurseries in some important sense. We're civilized in these three societies. But when Pius XI asserted that the family is more sacred than the state, he was talking about schools. He was talking about the school issue. OK, now the next section is called dystopian scenarios. Yeah, it might be interesting to briefly consider what these older popes, Leo and Pius XI in particular, would have considered a dystopian scenario. A scenario that's specifically social rather than a so-called natural disaster. And a scenario that could have been imagined within the frame of the social magisterium's principles and experiences. So Leo was born in 1810, during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, Pius XI was born in 1857, just before our Civil War. But Pius XI lives all the way to 1939, so they had plenty of experience, if you go 1810 to 1939. Now, a dystopian scenario would be the demise, or something approximating the demise, of the three necessary societies. The really big one is to see all three going down at once, cl clinging to one another and going down at once. But it could be instigated from above or below. The scenario from above was rather easily imaginable. For one thing, the church had experienced that very scenario during the French Revolution. And the rise of the totalitarians after World War I was a plausibly scary replay of that. Warning of a communist collective utopia, Pius XI actually went so far as to refer to the appearance of the Antichrist, according to 2 Thessalonians 2.4. That's in Divini Redemptoris. On this scenario, all three necessary societies, including the political, 
would be removed from everyday life. Perhaps some aspect of these societies would remain, but only as outsourced emanations of the collective or the party or whatever it is, like some aspects of administrative authority, aspects of domestic order in terms you need, you need breeders, and aspects of religion that's been suborned by the collective. Perhaps even well-intentioned states could get more than halfway down the field of this kind of dystopian situation simply by overplaying their subsidiary function in times of emergency. This is the, basically the gist of Quadragesimo Anno, 1931, which was written on the 40th anniversary of Rerum Novarum. In a condition of perpetual mobilization, the state absorbs the life of the other societies without formally or legally forbidding their existence. Thus, the principle of subsidiarity had to be toughly reintroduced in, in Quadragesimo Anno as a limit on distributive justice. It, that is, a limit on giving subsidium to others. Sure, the state should help the other societies, but there's a limit on it. That is, all of those societies in the bosom of the commonwealth should receive such assistance as is necessary, but not to the detriment of their unique social forms. The principle of subsidiarity presupposes a subsidiarity, it puts a limit on it, according to distributive justice. As for the scenario from below, I will outline one example of demise that made more than cameo appearances in both Leo and Pius XI. It's the liberal utopia, or dystopia. Suppose that the three necessary institutions of human flourishing are, as Leo worried, and to quote Leo, reduced to the genus of commercial contracts, which can be rightly revoked at the will of those who made them. While he did comfort, he certainly comprehended the nucleus of the liberal ideology, what we today call neoliberalism. There was no neo in it then for him. But for the most part, I mean, he actually has the scenario of the cr creation of liberal states on the basis of a kind of uh, contract in which we only take out as much authority as we need uh, so long as you pay for it. Like, who gets use of the fire department or something? But usually, this liberal scenario arises with regard to marriage and domestic life. That is, social forms, marriage and family, might be left to be determined either by the state or more likely from below by private contract with state sanction. That is, marriage and family both are turned into arbitrary societies whose forms are stipulated. Example, now from Pius XI. Uh, Casti Canubii, so which is, which is issued 50 years after Arcanum Divine. By the way, these two encyclicals on marriage, uh, Arcanum Divine and Casti and Canubii, are the only two encyclical teachings on marriage that exist to this day. Formal, formal and synoptic magisterial teachings in encyclical form. And here's what worried Pius in 1931. Suppose that there is no recognized matrimonial form or ends, in which case it would seem to follow that there are plural forms that can be determined by private contract. I quote him, some confidently assert that they have found no evidence of the existence of matrimony in nature or in her laws, but regard it merely as the means of producing life and gratifying, gratifying in one way or another a vehement impulse. On the other hand, some recognize certain beginnings, or as it were, seeds of true wedlock, 
are found in the nature of man, since unless men were bound together by some sort of permanent tie, the dignity of husband and wife or the natural end of propagating and rearing the offspring would not receive satisfactory provision. At the same time, they maintain that in all beyond this germinal idea of matrimony, through various concurrent causes, marriage is invented solely by the mind of man and established by his will." Unquote. Hence, what the state cares about in marriage is only one sacred thing, which is really reproduction. By the way, we still had states back there that cared about that, amazingly enough, even though this is a dystopian <laughs> example. And from which follows the state's rightful political and legal interests in eugenics, demographics, and the like. The rest, including the form and ends beyond reproduction, can be left to private contract. Some men, pious averred, go so far as to con concoct new species of unions suited, as they say, to the present temper of men in the times, which new forms of matrimony they presume to label temporary, experimental, and companionate. Three new options should be available by law. Actually, this sounds like it was written a few months or a couple of years ago. Okay. Now, this dystopic scenario from below, I'm going to call it the liberal one because it's based one Leo said, just make commutative just the justice of exchange, as we understand it, by private commercial contract, that which rules the roost. It was imaginable to them, but uh, unlikely. It was an unlikely option. At least when Leo and Pius wrote their social letters. For one thing, state formation in various species of nationalism were very robust. People were not talking about post-national futures between 1878 and 1939. Wars and economic crises kept European humanity and the rest of the world touched by it in an almost continual state of mobilization. Who could believe that social problems could be solved and ordinary life generally improved by the withering of the state? I mean, not even the Marxists made the state wither away. What responsible person or authority could allow the organs of society to perish in the Schumpeterian process of creative destruction? By the way, not even Joseph Schumpeter believed that. From the onset of the wars of the 20th century through the post-war recovery of the 1950s, actually the principle of hierarchical complementarity was intact in practice, even if the social ontology and metaphysics of it weakened. Simply put, people needed each other. And they needed sustained cooperation on the part of those necessary societies. This was even true in some totalitarian states, not all of them. So, a general observation. The three great societies paradigm traversed some very choppy historical waters, and the social magisterium understood that it could be upset from above or below. They didn't give enough attention to below, I think, and I'll tell you why in a minute or two. Uh, a lot of people told them they should look at, that actually the dystopia that would come from liberalism and commercial contracts would be the thing that would do it in. Heinrich Pesch told them that, Karl Polanyi, Joseph Chumpeteer. They pointed out that relations ensuing upon market competition would tend toward constructed, stipulated, and transient social forms. But from the perspective of what Pius XI called his pontifical watchtower, the historical and social scene was marked over and over again by the church eking out its own ecclesial, social, educational existence from the states. From his watchtower, it's from 1931, that's from Costi Canubi. It's the state that's wrecking it from above, or at least the thing that we're having to contest with. 
contend with. And the wisdom of their paradigm, mostly ignoring the problem that dystopia comes from below, seemed to be confirmed by the deep and sustained cooperation of social institutions after 1945, at least in Western Europe. And Pache, my old friend Richard Newhouse, the Catholic moment actually happened in the decades just after World War II, not the 1980s. And that recovery, beginning in Europe and led by Catholics and Catholic political parties, right, no, yielded really significant economic development. This was the heyday of what's today called the glorious decades. The marvelous down payment of wealth, education, and social energy given to the baby boom. And the model of social cooperation at work in Western Europe was given prominence in magisterial and conciliar documents, Pachamancheris, Gaudium et Spes, Populorum Progressio, and recommended for the progress of the rest of the developing world. Social markets without socialism, nation states without chronic wars, development as another name for peace. The magisterial optimism of the post-World War II time did not include anything like post-match national, much, much less post-matrimonial or post-ecclesial future. They'd find out pretty soon. But it was naively expected that the friendly hands of social cooperation could or would tame nationalism, even making less necessary the overweening use of ecclesiastical authority without prejudice prejudice to the necessary societies. And that's when the black swans appeared. That is, the things that were not anticipated. And according to Lore, the appearance of a black swan should lead those who only thought of white ones to rewrite their previous sayings about swans. OK, my final section, two revolutions from below. I want to begin with a little story that I think means more than as plain facts might first suggest. In 2004, Cardinal Renato Raffaele Martino, president of the Pontifical Council of Justice and Peace, presented the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church. Five years of painstaking work, including a topical index of 150 pages, I mean, only Germans used to do that kind of work, but here was the Pontifical Council doing it. And it produced a, a beautiful volume. The authors compiled several hundred chunks of magisterial text, sorted according to principles, topics, applications. And there's a vast array of material running from the book of Genesis to the Holy See's intervention in Kyoto on the occasion of the Third World Water Forum. The bulk of the magisterial texts, pontifical and curial, are drawn from 1958 up to 2004. The notable thing is that these several hundred blocks of text are simply juxtaposed under topical headings. There is no argument, no philosophical synthesis, no historical narrative. I had this subversive thought, which I still have, that this enormous compilation without philosophical or historical vectors represents a tradition that's either sublimely confident in itself or a tradition that's so overwhelmed that it can only give authoritative blessing to the juxtapositions representing a series of responses to crises, still awaiting a synthesis sometime. And I think it's the crises, not admitted, the black swans. They came from below. Neither was instigated by higher ruling powers, although political and social authorities surely accommodated them really quickly. The revolutions probably have no single cause, but they are interrelated in origin and cumulative in impact. 
Each is utopic, not merely in the minds of men, but as emergent in real social life. And I don't need to describe them in very much detail, because even if we do not comprehend all of the causes or future courses they might take, all of us know quite well what they are. First, the Cultural Revolution of the 1960s. Not the one in China. But the spirit of new things that sprang from the West and manifested itself internationally. It had a generational focus, but by no means a generational limit. And to put it bluntly, by way of generalization, the three necessary societies were deemed by a lot of people. They were deemed to be unendurable. In a paradoxical acknowledgement of the complementarity of the three societies, domestic, ecclesial, and political, these were perceived as being a single repressive hierarchy in cahoots of the establishment, so to speak. And it's amazing, when you went to school, when you went to church, when you were inducted into the military, it all looked the same, more or less. That's why I say this notion of being a repressive hierarchy was not entirely mistaken. And perhaps the social and institutional authorities harbored the same thought because they soon reconfigured themselves as permissive hierarchies very quickly. Churches, politicians, and parents were like deer caught in headlights. And the church, after Humani Vitae, 68, took the spirit to be sexual and moral revolution, but there's a lot more to it than that. And the first set of responses, just as the church had to do to the revolutions of 1789, very clumsy, clumsy to say the least. And this is why we always have to remember with great reverence and respect John Paul II, who tried in a way that was not clumsy, to show that marriage and family are not repressive hierarchies. And, as a corollary, that polity and church are not merely permissive. I mean, that was taking on that first revolution from below, right at the deepest roots of it. And that he turned right away to the situation of marriage and family, of course, is quite traditional, well within that Leonine paradigm because marriage and family are not only the most vulnerable of the three societies, but the most important one to get right, in a way. Whoever shrinks from domestic society is not very well prepared to live in the other two. And Wojtyla increasingly came to believe that the crisis of the 20th century is anthropological, by which he meant, we are not just dealing with sporadic spirits of distemper with regard to institutions. The distinctive mark of the age is what which he was friend Rocco Battiglione really aptly called negative anthropology. And it's manifest in the ready affirmation of what man is not, combined with very deep-seated reluctance to affirm normative anthropological content. And I'm not going to rehearse all of that here, but let one remark suffice. As Pope, he spoke to the Roman Rhoda of anthropologies that regard the human, given by nature, as raw data, a prolepsis or outline of what man might be if he's made specifically human in the historical and cultural sphere. Told in different ways, it's the myth of a proto-man who awaits humanization through the efficacy of culture, a sphere of freedom in which a multiplicity of forms can be imparted to this proto-humanum. This is eerily close to what Leo and Pius worried about as the noxious seeds of the calamity from below. Uh, the, the normativity, universal normativity of commercial contracts as the model for society depends upon the negative anthropological premise, he thought. And so in our modern times, we can imagine polity, marriage, and church as being pretty much optional, not normative, informative institutions in which we live a life and achieve perfections over generations, so much as instruments that can be used to live out 
a life of our own choosing, negative anthropology construes the three gate societies for happiness as platforms for self-revision rather than for the perfection of a nature. That's why you don't have to live in our institutions. No one believes the Starbucks is the perfection of a nature. No one believes, that, very few people believe that marriage is either or you know, any kind of serious ecclesial communion. Now, a cautionary note can be drawn. The older Leonine pattern usually had the church aiming its complaints about social order to the governments. It's almost always true. You can read it for yourself. That this habit needed to be moderated in the face of the cultural revolution. I use the term moderated, not abstained. You shouldn't abstain from it, but because our cultural revolution was not a mere creature of the state. Rather, government permissively accommodated the spirit of the revolution piece by piece. Such regimes, by and large, do not believe they have any authority to dismantle the cultural revolution. Leo had better luck with Bismarck on this front. Now, the second revolution, to use Pope Francis' own terms, is techno-economic. Sometimes today it's called neoliberalism, but I'm willing to abandon the word just to say globalized and fi mostly financialized markets combined with the dynamisms of global communications. In uh, late spring of 1992, I think almost everyone in this room will remember, Justice Kennedy delivered his famous line about the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, the mystery of human life. But only three months later, Deng Xiaoping proposed an answer to the meaning of life that's much less abstract. Late summer, 1992. To get rich is glorious. He explained there is only one thought, one firm rule, sometimes translated hard truth, which is economic development, just as it's understood in the West. And he defended the correlates of this one hard truth. Implications. Some get rich very quickly, others lose. But in view of aggregate sums, the people will be happier. Now, Deng's discovery of the meaning of human life had momentous effects, but he did not invent the expectation that on the whole, a hot, global, heavily financialized and speculative economy would be worth the social cost. He didn't invent that idea. It was well underway in the West. Despite the fact that every nook and cranny of the social order today in our societies is deeply invested in Deng's one hard truth, our pensions, our university endowments, our family savings. The budgets of our municipalities and of our state governments. Who knows about the feds? You guys in this room will know about the feds because they can keep on making adaptions. We are all invested in this one hard truth. Some get rich quick, others lose. But on the whole, it'd be worth the social costs. But few people would be able to describe in concrete social terms what it is. What does it mean that average, the average duration of shareholding in a company amounts to two months? That life expectancy of a firm, Fortune 500, is less than 15 years. By the way, if my university is totally invested in the Fortune 500, it means my university is only going to last for 15 more years on the whole, on average. Figure it out for yourself. That banking assets in a given nation could exceed 500% of gross domestic product. 
with only the flimsiest underlying real assets. Now, I'm not going to go into all of that or even give a moral critique, but I want to raise a question for CSD that goes back to the one that I was raising at the beginning about why that compendium just can't come to any historical or philosophic, philosophical synthesis. They don't know how to describe this stuff. Uh, what do we call social reality when social entities have lifespans shorter than those of one's pets? Like, to whom do we as assess social costs? In the old days, we take our complaint to the state, but I'm not sure the state is the main agent in this. In his book on modern social imaginaries, Charles Taylor argues that in modern times, economic life was the first social imaginary to achieve an identity independent of the political sphere. It is a new normal order of mutual enrichment that is at once profoundly social, and let's say interactive all the way down. It has to be social because a market is semiotical. It's a set of signs of some sort. But it cannot be classified under the usual category of collective action. Agents reciprocally affect one another in some systematic way, but the beneficence of the system has to be evaluated in light of a concatenation of what happens behind our backs. That is precisely when we're not being social. So imagine economic life is in tension with the other two modern social imaginaries. For Taylor, that's the sovereign people and civil society. For being based on competition as the one hard truth, the lowest bed, bid, the lowest bid gets the job. The economic sphere seems to lack either the collective action of political life or the many modes of benevolence, however transitory, of voluntary associations. Unlike the corporate company towns of yesteryear, Eastman Kodak, maybe Phillips Petroleum, in which diverse people with different skills lived, usually for more than 15 years, uh, together. Many of most firms today have no obvious social locus. They can be treated as having legal personality but they decimate and allow themselves to be decimated through mergers and acquisitions and other such processes. And this is no extrinsic critique because it's based on how firms act, themselves act. I mean, I'll be gone, you'll be gone, less than 15 years and our debts can be purchased on a competitively priced market. It has no resemblance to a society. If we are to judge contemporary corporate entities, we need to know something more about their effects. How do we classify them to begin with? And since Vatican II, I'm leading up to this answer about the compendium. The social ontology of what's called business has included quite diverse descriptions and emphases. Gaudi Metzpez, for example, asserts that only work or labor is human. All the rest of the factors have merely the nature of tools. John Paul also refers to the need to distinguish work from mechanisms. Economic mechanisms that are not regulated by a juridical framework as such, in such ways to serve human freedom in its totality, John Paul said, cannot be approved. Now this does not exactly answer the question whether such things are social entities gone rogue or mere tools inadequately socialized. That's the question. Do we have what should be or are social entities gone rogue? Corporations of all sorts that have become the DNA of all kinds of other aspects of society and they, they've simply gone rogue. They're under the imperative of Deng Xiaoping now. Or are these just tools needing to be socialized? On balance, John Paul and Benedict XVI have suggested that maybe we can think of some of these economic phenomena best under the category of civil society. And this is why right in that centesimus honest, 
he says, perhaps we should use the term business economy. Because terms like free and market are appropriate features of business, thought of in ordinary experience as a kind of social solidarity of entrepreneurs, employees who create and distribute real goods and services, make investments in research and investment for the future, and altogether are an expanding chain of solidarity having some social depth. The events that have ensued upon 2008 make this assignment of business to civil society really hard to swallow. Caritas and Veritate takes a huge step forward in this. If I'm not mistaken, Flavio will correct me. If I'm not mistaken, Caritas and Veritate, having the benefit of seeing the meltdown, is the first magisterial document to distinguish between a real and a financial or speculative economy. I don't believe it's to be found before that. So too, the first encyclical to really say there's a problem about short-term and long-term investment. Even hinting at the problem of corporations making no investment at all. It's the first encyclical to recognize that a financialized economy can evolve into a system of extraction, not investment. No expanding chain of solidarity, just the opposite. Even so, now I'm almost done, there's not much work given in Caritas and Peritate to describing, defining, or analyzing these things that are named. To give only a few examples of what I find completely deficient in magisterial teaching, even though they're named now, what is the real economy? There's no definition of it for me. And how is it different than a financial economy? And What's the gray area overlapping the two? What's normative in there? What's speculation? And what are its proper and improper vehicles? Most important, what is debt? Now, here's the Catholic Church having a wonderful synthesis of biblical and Aristotelian insights. You should be going after debt right away. Debt is a softball tossed to the social magistrate, but there's nothing about it. Even though it has profound roots in revealed theology and stands at the very center of the financial crises in both our national and global economies, it's usually less risky to invest in debt than in equities because while the contractual claim on equities rises and falls depending on a market valuation, the claim on debt remains fixed. And France has landed right on top of this. Someone had to start talking that way. What is debt? How do we make it go away? So Francis was elected and took as his coat of arms and motto on the Feast of St. Matthew. And he sees the tax collector. And having mercy, says to him, follow me. D.C. is wonderful to have the cathedral that's dedicated to a tax collector in the nation's capital, the conversion of a tax collector <laughs> in the nation's capital. But now, to my knowledge, Francis is the first pope to speak explicitly of international capitalism as a global system. That kind of language, for reasons that I don't have to give a lecture on, were avoided before. That is, it's a world system that renders familial institution, familiar institutions empty shells of technocracy in service of the empire of money. Yeah, he's fully alive to the decadent institutions. Francis almost always speaks about processes rather than institutions, movements rather than political parties, the praxis of those who live and suffer rather than boundaries and obligations set by law. We've come a long way since Leo XIII's modus operandi. Play the three necessary societies and urge moderate adjustments of institutions keyed to them. By the way, in neither of Pope Francis's two 
publications that really are in social doctrine, although he denies that the first one is, it clearly is, uh, which is uh, Evangelii Gaudium, is uh, neither that or Laudato Su ever mentions Rerum Novarum. It's like Leo never existed. But listen, when you just have a compendium with juxtaposed quotations, in a way, something doesn't exist that's been juxtaposed several pages before. But um, he uses a hermeneutic of, sus of suspicion, especially about intellectually framed social categories. And although more remarkably, his hermeneutic of suspicion begins with the church. Canon law, curial bureaucracy, doctrines compiled by scholars, rather than those of, that are purely and simply lived. And we are dealing now, to use his metaphor, with field hospitals in which the ministers are not so different than the patients. By the way, as much as I dislike that as having any kind of fundamental ground or being a fundamental ground of ecclesiology, it's a perfectly apt metaphor for remediating the condition of a people who cannot live in Leo's three necessary societies. Supposing the three necessary societies to be greatly weakened in, in the will and in the imagination of human beings is a perfect metaphor. Once upon we say, go and live in one of those societies. We would say, no, I don't want to live in one of those. Today, to paraphrase Dorothy Day, Everyone suffers the precarity of a migrant. That is, someone who doesn't live in one of those great, three great societies or not very well. By the way, the social science data is backing this up like all get out. But Francis seems eager to describe a world in which the three necessary societies are so crippled that we really are in a dystopia. What the necessary societies were once upon a time, either historically or doctrinally, in Francis, however, is rather watery in comparison to the vivid depictions that he gives of changing the world by praxis. Whereas the previous popes emphasized the importance of nation states and their moral and juridical relations to one another, Francis's global system leaves in suspense the agency and efficacy of the nation state because he flat out argues it's been compromised and suborned by money. He's very reluctant to speak of traditional sort of social categories. The people, he says, is a mystical rather than a logical category. It has to be the only thing with which he and Steve Bannon are in agreement, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> now, how all of these thoughts and themes, and surely more yet to come in our unsettled times, can be harmonized with and perfect that old Leo, Leonine pattern is very unclear. I guess we'll know the time is ripe when the Compendium the Catholic Social Doctrine provides both historical and philosophical synthesis of teachings. But my last paragraph. Francis's magisterium gives us reason to eschew a precipitous synthesis of social doctrine. By the way, I don't think he created this problem. It's there in the 2004 compendium for anyone who has eyes to see. Uh, for one thing, there is partisan division over to how to apply Catholic social doctrine or to even think about it. There's partisan division. And some of this partisan division is rooted in the question of which of the two revolutions from below should be regarded as the most urgent and deserving of our response. Should we be responding to the 60s and all of its ensuing consequences, moral, moral and social familial matters, or should we be re re responding to Deng Xiaoping? More important and long lasting, I think, is the probability that in a fully globalized church, 
not everyone will see and interpret social problems in the same way. That's already happening. I mean, that sturdy, and sturdy simplicity of the Leonine paradigm, even if people still study scholastic categories and stuff, how that's going to be filtered in Philippines compared to Texas is much different. Leo didn't have to contend with that. When he talked from above, he really talked from above. He was not talking to a globalized church. He was talking to a global church. This is a very precarious unity, much different than Leo's world. But that's a black swan for another time. I'm going to end it there. Enough time? Thank you.